Now, AM650 presents It's Your Money, an up-close and personal look at your finances. Here's your host, Fred Snyder. Up in the morning and out to school. Okay, we're back. Remind you once again, this is a weekly show. We talk about your money, more importantly about how to keep it. And we don't do a very good job in that particular area. Statistically, if you take 100 people who started equal today at the age of 25, by the time they end up at 65, one is wealthy, four are well-to-do, five are still working, 36 are dead, there's 54 left, they're dead broke, dependent on family and state. So the statistics tell us that we don't do a very good job at keeping our money, and primarily because they don't teach us how to do that in school. Well, that's what this show is all about. We're here to teach you how you can keep your hard-earned dollars. And one of the simplest ways to do that is to make sure that you spend less than you earn. If you spend less than you earn, you will automatically accumulate money. The problem is that people don't do that. They spend more than they earn. They don't keep track of their money. They don't, they don't have a budget. They don't know what's coming in. They can't measure it, primarily because they don't have a financial plan. Ask yourself this question. How long have I worked? How much money have I made during my working career so far? I don't care if you're young or old or somewhere in between. How much money have I made during my working career so far, and how much of that do I have left today? And the chances are you're not very happy with the answer to that question. So we have the answers here on this show. We talk about financial planning principles. We talk about how you can create a plan, how you can do ongoing financial planning, and how you can make sure that you have the best products inside your overall financial plan. That's what it's all about. It's not about how much you make that counts. It's about how much you keep. How much you keep is the key phrase. And if you aren't proactive about how you deal with your money, you won't keep much of it. You let your money manage you if you don't have a plan. Someone once said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so that's your default plan. If you don't have a financial plan, you're planning to fail. So it's time to get one. Give us a call. We'll provide you one uh, pro bono, absolutely free, no cost, no obligation. All you have to do is make a phone call. Remind you once again, ladies and gentlemen, that this is an interactive show. We share this show with you, our listening audience. I'm going to give the numbers out. I suggest you get a pencil, a paper, piece of paper, make notes, write the numbers down, talk to us, talk to us about your money. If you have financial concerns, talk to us. If you have worries about your money, if you don't know whether you have the best investments inside your portfolio, if you're not sure of the portfolio that you have right now, if you're not sure that it's suitable for you, maybe it's too risky. Maybe the rate of return is less than what you need. If you have any of those questions on your mind, it's time to make a phone call. Here's the numbers. Area code 604-280-0650. Should you be calling long distance, it's 877-280-0650. Frida is down at the office for those who are shy or reluctant to talk on the air. Area code 604-737-3512. If you're calling long distance, it's 1-800-661-1495. So some people are shy. They tell me, I'd love to call the show, but I, I don't. I, I'm just shy. I don't want to be on the air. Call Frida then. But really, if you call here, you can make a meaningful contribution to the show. Maybe you're a client already. Maybe you've attended a workshop or a seminar. Uh Maybe you might want to make a comment or you have a question. Get on the line. Talk to us about your money and how to keep it. Maybe you've done something really unique with your money that's made you wealthy and you want to share that with our listeners. Or maybe you did something where you were wealthy and you lost all your money and you might want to share that uh, with our listeners. Let's talk about your money, more importantly about your money and how to keep it. And I remind you once again, the first hour that you listened to between 9 and 10, that was, a, that was a replay. This show is live. So once again, 604-280-0650. Long distance, 877-280-0650. Uh, log on, www.am650radio.com, and you can click Watch TV, and you can see us live. And to remind you once again, if you're shy or reluctant to talk on the air, Frida's down at the office, area code 604-737-3512. If you're calling long distance, it's 1-800-661-1495. If you just tuned in, I'm certified financial planner Fred Snyder, also registered financial planner representing Scotia McLeod 
and I have lots of experience in this uh, particular business, many, many years of experience, and I want to talk to you, and I want to help you, and I want to educate you about how to keep, uh, about how to keep more of your hard-earned dollars. I'm going to start out by talking about government debt. Okay, so I have some links here on this uh, particular page. If you're watching, if you're not, I'll just tell you what they are. But if uh, we want to talk about government debt and we want to see just how bad it is out there, because we think that the government's going to look after us, okay? I want you to think about that. Do you really believe that the government is going to be able to look after you? With Social Security, the old age pension which gets clawed back, penalizing you for saving too much money? Uh, the Canada Pension Plan, which is, if it isn't underfunded, probably soon will be. The Canada Pension Plan is is questionable whether they're going to be able to meet their future unfunded liabilities. Uh, maybe you have a, a defined benefit pension plan with a corporation, which is all already underfunded. There isn't enough money in there to be able to pay the, the, the uh, future defined contributions that they're uh, obliged to pay. So there's unfunded uh, future liabilities there. Let's just talk about the word debt. And I think the main reason why people fail financially is they owe too much. They don't know how to manage it. And I think that's true of individuals. I think it's true of corporations. I think it's true of municipalities, provinces, and governments in general. So a lot of debt out there. Okay, so let's take a look at the world debt situation. And again, I'm just waiting for my uh, computer to log on here. It comes right now. And I can't even read this number. It's uh, 53 million seven hundred seventy-seven thousand trillion one hundred seventy-eight thousand three hundred thirty-six dollars. That's the world debt. But more importantly, if we look at individual countries, if we look at Canada, here's the the picture in Canada. The public debt is one point six trillion dollars per person. That's forty-six thousand six hundred fifty-two dollars. Write that number down, because every man, woman, and child, if you were to amortize that debt over every person in Canada, it's $46,652.58 spread across a population of 35 uh, million people. The public debt as a percentage of gross domestic product is 85.9%. The total annual debt charge, that's the interest on the debt, is 4.2%. Now, we can compare that on this map with any other country in the world. But I like to get things down to the bottom line. Per person in Canada, the debt, will say, is $47,000. And we think the United States is worse off than we are, according to the information I have here. If I look at the U.S., uh, now my computer has messed me up here a little bit. Hold on for just one second. I pull the number off. In the U.S., the number per person is $43,000. Excuse me, uh, I don't know what happened here. So I'm going to have to go back around the block on this one. Hang on for just one second. I can't pull that over. I don't know what happened. Huh. I can't click on the U.S., but it's almost the same. Bottom line is the debt in the United States is almost the same as it is in Canada. Uh, that's the U.S. I got it right now. So the figure per person in the United States is $43,000. It's less than Canada. Okay? $43,489,000 over a population of 318 million people. As a percentage of gross national product, it's 83.9%. Not much different in Canada. The total debt charge on that uh, interest rate rise is 11.7%, though it's more expensive. So I want you to think about that for a minute. That's just Canada in the United States. And I can go anywhere in the world. I can look at Great Britain. I can make a comparison. If I look at Great Britain as an example, per person it's 40000 If I look at uh, France, uh, per person it's 37000 If I look at Spain, per person it's 22000 If I look at Italy, I don't have numbers for, excuse me, I do here for Italy, it's 39000 It doesn't differ very much. If I look at Russia by comparison, it's only $1,455 per person. But this is a serious, serious problem. If you think the government's going to be able to look after you, then you better pick your politicians uh, wisely and pick politicians that are going to find a way to get rid of that debt. It's going to be pretty hard to do. Let's talk to Ingrid from Gabriella Island. Ingrid, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you. 
This Thanks is, for uh, calling. I appreciate your call. A, a pleasure to be able to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to take it off the speakerphone. And I can hear it better. Okay. Yes, okay. I'm at a bit of a junction. Um, and and when, just as you were stating all the, uh, you know, around 40000 debt for everybody, yep. mm-hmm. that would be interesting to have that age-related. Because I'm 76. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know if there's any uh, way to do that. If there is, it, it would be interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting. interesting. But I'm just trying to say, I'm trying to find a way to strip away all the veneer and get right down to the core issue. And, and the core right. issue for every man, woman, and child in the country, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a uh, good thing to do. But and I uh, and, and do that's, that's pretty onerous. <laughs> and the reason the governments get into that position is this. They spend more than they take in. Yeah. Yes. And the reason individuals get into financial difficulty and find themselves massively in debt is the fact that they spend more than they take in. Is the same, yeah. Well, I've I've reached a happy age of seventy six, um, and I do have my home free and clear. But I have I have a I'm at a junction on another house on Gabriola Island. Mm-hmm. The market on Gabriola is falling rapidly. And I do have renters in it, and I'm trying to make the decision, do I struggle on and, you know, put the new roof and do this and do that, that it will need in the near future, and keep that about 1000 a month income, or do I uh, take my loss from what I paid for it to what it's on the market now at less than it's... Here's the question. How much did you pay for it? 515 What's it worth today? Uh, the agent will list it at 395 Ouch. Yeah. So you got a you got a big capital loss there. Yes, okay. I, I made a pretty good uh, gain on what I sold in Deep Cove, but uh, when I bought the, the house at five fifteen, but I seem to have bought it at, at the height of the market. So you have uh, you have unused capital gains. I don't know. Not a you paid bit. tax on that capital gain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. You know, if, if 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 you sell the real estate, you have a capital loss that can be carried forward indefinitely to use against future capital gains. Yes. Uh, so it's not all bad news necessarily. Yeah. Um, the, the, the income that you get, uh, I think your question really is, what is real estate on Gabriella Island going to do? Is it and going to increase or decrease? That. Because <laughs> if you knew it was going to go up, you wouldn't want to sell. You, you, you wouldn't sell. No, and that's what I thought when I first bought it. But it's been other yeah. than that with the BC ferry system and all that. It's a market timing issue, and it's just like stocks, just like mutual funds. People that tell you they they know what the markets are going to do, they're full of it because they can't. You can't predict what markets are going to do. Right. Nobody really, really knows. I bought a house in the village in North Vancouver uh, back in uh, when I first moved to British Columbia for ninety five thousand dollars. Three years later, in November of eighty one. It was worth uh, two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. In November of eighty one, it dropped in that same month from two fifty to one fifty. Yeah. Just yeah. overnight. I've I've lived through that and I've done somewhat yeah. similar. I'm glad I didn't buy it when it was two fifty. Yes. Yeah. I bought it well, so I did, didn't really care. I was living in it. It was my principal residence. Yes. The mortgage on that house was six percent. It came due at eighteen percent in November of eighty one. Yes. Yes. I had a credit line with a major bank for $25,000, which was called in November of 81. Yeah, oh. And had oh. nothing to do with credit of any kind whatsoever. They said, we're calling all of our, our yeah. demand loans because uh, we have uh, problems with defaults from f- loans we made to foreign countries. And that was the issue back in 81 globally. Yes. So I had a credit line called, the value of my house dropped, and my mortgage renewed from 6% to 18%. That's called a perfect storm, financially speaking. Yes, I've seen that, actually. It, it was, and uh, there was I all kinds it. of people prior to that that were wealthy as heck. You had very young people that were in their 30s and 40s that had owned two or three houses that had gone way up in value. Yes. Uh, all kinds of people in 81 went broke because their real estate holdings crashed. Right. Yes. And the question is, could it happen again? And I say this, I say the only way you can protect yourself 
against bad investments is to diversify, diversify, diversify. Yes. And you need a really good financial advisor to be able to get your overall diversification right. That's called strategic asset allocation. That's the concept. Yes. So what is your strategic asset allocation? What is it? And what should it be based on what's going on at, at the moment and based on your overall objectives? That's what you need to take a serious look at. And that's why you probably need a financial plan, a financial planner. And then you've got to evaluate. You've got to have an evaluation system to be able to evaluate the investments that you hold inside your plan. Yes, yes. I have that, actually. And, uh, but I'm just uh, trying to make the decision on that one particular house, whether to keep it rented, which brings me you know, 12000 a year income, or, and, and I can write off things against that. The or only way take the uh, loss on selling it. Yeah, sorry to kind of interrupt you there, Ingrid, but the only way to answer that question is this. You need to sit down with somebody like myself. You need to prepare a proper financial plan. You need to evaluate your whole situation. I don't have enough information that I can tell you whether you should or whether you shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, you um, uh, no doubt own the house you live in. Yes. And it's probably appreciated in value quite nicely. A bit. Is I don't it, know it, if you're paying big taxes. You may be or you may not be. So no, you're ta- over 55, you don't have, you can defer your taxes at 1%. Yeah, I'm talking now, though, I'm talking about uh, income tax, not yeah. property taxes. Yes. Uh, and you can only defer the taxes on your principal residence, the house you live in. Yes. And that may be a good idea for a lot of people. Yes. Uh, but again, uh, f- from from the point of view of giving you specific advice regarding whether you should sell that piece of property or not, uh, I don't have enough information. I'd have to do a full interview uh, here on the air, and, and we airtime doesn't allow it. Right. But if right. you want to uh, give Frida a call, I'd be happy to give you a call next week, and we can talk on the phone, and maybe there's something I can do to help you. Okay. Thank you very much So for that. I'll give you Frida's number out once again, area code 604-737-3512. You're oh. probably calling long distance over there, so it's 800 800- Six six one one four nine five, and she's down at the office right now. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, Ingrid. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your call on this gorgeous day. I hope the weather over there is nice as it oh, is it's here. Oh, incredible! It's really beautiful. Yeah. The um, um, one when you're giving out your numbers. Yes. It was too fast for me. Okay, I'm going to do it again. And thanks for <laughs> reminding me because I do sometimes go too fast. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, yes. Frida down at the office. Area code six zero four. Seven three seven. Seven three seven. I had seven three eight. Seven three seven three five one two. Yes. Now in your case, I guess you're calling long distance. Yes. So it's one eight hundred six six one one four nine five. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, Ingrid. Appreciate your call. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Hope you're going to watch the soccer game. Oh, you bet. Eleven forty five. It starts. Okay. <laughs> you take care. Have a good day. Okay. You too. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. If you just joined us, uh, Ingrid's line is now open. Maybe you do have a question regarding your financial plan. Maybe regarding your financial planner. Maybe regarding your investments. How do you know whether your portfolio of investments is suitable? What are some of the ways to measure a portfolio to know that it's suitable? You have a way to measure risk. Is it risky? Is your tolerance for risk low, moderate, or high? Let's say that your tolerance for risk is low and you have a portfolio that's high risk. It's not suitable. Let's say, on the other hand, uh, you have a portfolio that has an expected rate of return of 7%, but you need 12%. Maybe your portfolio is not suitable because it's not going to get you to where you want to go. Maybe you need to adjust your financial objectives accordingly if that's the case. So you need to sit down and you need to talk to somebody that you can trust, somebody that's knowledgeable and can help you uh, navigate the, uh, the situation that's out there. Remember, if you're picking investment funds, there's over 20,000 investment funds to select from. How does your financial advisor select funds? Some of these funds have awesome rates of return last year, but if you look at them over the last five years, their rates of return are terrible. Okay, on the other hand, their rate of return last year might not have been very good, but their five-year rate of return was terrific. Okay, Uh, if you listened uh, to the uh, replay that uh, we did just before this show with Dr. Don Nexdorf, uh, he's a client of mine, actually. 
And I, I listen to that show on the way out here. I think that show was very revealing. We talked to, we, we really had a great conversation about investments and how we select them and all that kind of stuff. So, but I, I try to give people ways to remember things because you listen to this show, you don't take notes, and after it's all over, you say, well, I really like that show, but what did I learn? And you can't define it. I want you to think about this. Everybody needs three Ps. So visualize three Ps. And I don't mean the vegetable. The letter P. Visualize them. The first P stands for plan. The investors group, great big investment company, they call it the plan. The plan. All in capitals. As if it's almost holy. And maybe it is. It's the holy grail, we'll say, of financial planning. The plan. So what's your plan? What's your plan for money? What's your money plan? What's it look like? What's your plan for your health? Health and wealth, they go hand in hand. What's your social plan? What's your spiritual plan? What's your mental plan? You need a plan for everything. Napoleon Hill says anything that you can vividly imagine, ardently desire, and enthusiastically act upon will inevitably come to pass. So you want to achieve all your wishes? You need a plan. So start with a plan, but you don't finish with a plan. A plan that you you make and you put it on the shelf and forget about it isn't going to work. Okay, so the second stage is planning. That's, That's working the plan. That's looking at the plan. That's talking about the plan. That's reevaluating the plan on a regular basis. And the last part is having the right financial products inside the plan. And when I talk about financial products, I'm talking about investments. I'm talking about insurance. I'm talking about uh, risk management. I'm talking about your will. And in in a minute, we're going to go and we're going to talk about what is a financial plan. So if you're listening to the show right now, you want to get a better idea of what this plan looks like, stay tuned because we'll be doing an analysis, an anatomy of an overall financial plan. So again, if, if, if you look at that, and I don't know, many of you can't see this, but if you look at North America, it's red on the map. If you look at uh, Brazil, it's red on the map. If you look at Britain and Spain and Italy, and I'm talking about when I say Britain, I mean the United Kingdom, it's red. Ireland isn't quite red yet. If we look at uh, India, it's red. If we look at China and Australia, it's red. If we look at Japan, it's red. Those countries are the countries that are uh, the greatest debtors on the planet. That's serious, okay? And most of the time, the average public debt for almost every one of those countries is somewhere around $35,000, $40,000 per citizen. That is huge. And how is the world going to get rid of that debt? Ultimately, they either have to grow their economic pie or they have to print more money. And printing money means inflation. And if you have a financial plan that's generating 4% and taxable, it means you're keeping two of the four. And if inflation is three, your rate of return is really negative. It's minus. And if you don't know... Uh, You you know, you say, I don't want to take risk by investing in equity funds. I'm going to put my money in good old safe GICs or whatever, and you get 2%. I had a client call me last week, not a client right now, but he's got almost a million dollars in a checking account at 2%. I don't even think he's getting two on a checking account, but that's what he told me. So if you get 2%, the government's going to tax that. So your real return is close to 1%. And if inflation is 4, you're minus 3. So you're going backwards. You're not going to get to where you want to go financially with that plan. So how are you going to invest that money so that you can get a real rate of return after taxes and inflation? How are you going to do that? You need to have a financial advisor that can help you select products that are suitable to your circumstances. And the key word is suitable. It isn't easy. You have to become more proactive about your money, not reactive. You can't sit back and say, well, I'm not going to worry about it. Somehow, by magic, I'm going to get to where I want to go financially. 
Well, you might if you win the lottery. That's not likely to happen. So how are you going to craft? How are you going to sit down and build and create, design an overall financial plan that's going to take you from where you are right now to where you want to go financially? How are you going to do that? You need help, okay? That is the bottom line. You need help. Most people don't have that help, and most people won't get there. So we're talking about your money. We're talking about your money and how to keep it. That's the bottom line, and the most important part of that statement is how to keep it. We all make it. We just don't keep it. Everybody earns money. We just don't keep it. Because they didn't teach us in school how to do that, and I'm trying to fill that gap right now. Let's talk to Peter from Pender Island. Peter, welcome to the program. Well, yeah. Good, good morning, Fred. Good morning, Peter. How you doing? I'm doing fine, but I'm not in Pender, ha- ha- Pender Island. I'm in Pender, Pender Harbor. Harbor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. At any rate. Nice talking to you. How are you? I'm, I'm, well, I got up this morning, and, you know, that's a pretty good start. That's um, a good start. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's so gorgeous up here, you can't believe it. I know. I love Pender Harbor. I I lived up there for the first 10 years I was in B.C. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, hey, Fred, yeah. one, of the, one, one of the questions that I have been asked when I've talked to other younger people about you and your show is, okay, I get a financial plan, and I start tomorrow on putting away money. Mm-hmm. So maybe I, I am asked, Ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand, I can't go to a major uh, financial institution with ten thousand bucks and say, "Hey, what am I going to do with this?" So, what do you do with it? I know that you have a limit, and m- many well, I, others do. I, I tell people, Peter, if you have somebody that has ten thousand dollars to invest and that's all they have. I will still give them financial advice, and I'll tell them uh, the best place, the best way to invest the money. Okay. He, he, even if I can't handle the account myself, I can refer them to somebody that can, and I will give them advice. All good, right. Good sound advice, actually. Well, that's good because you know we're talking, uh, and the majority of the time, <laughs> I think your 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 program is is aimed at people who have a little bit more than ten thousand dollars. That's correct. So. Uh, I'm thinking people have to start, and that's what basically you're trying to get them to do. Well, I have to, I have to be careful that I don't get so many accounts that I can't manage them, because I, there's a requirement that I manage accounts properly, of and course. if I if I take too many accounts, there, there's just no way I can manage them. That's no, the obviously. problem. Sure, uh, sure. But I, I I I know people within the industry that I can refer and I can give advice. Or let's say somebody calls me and they say, I have $10,000 to invest. Here's my circumstances. How should I invest that money? And I might think, I might say, well, they should put that money into ABC. I'm picking this arbitrarily. Yeah, a- right. ABC Growth Investment Fund. Uh, and I, I I would say, well, he, that, that's, that's a good investment for that money, and here's how to get it. You can buy it online. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I put myself in a position that I will give people advice. Uh, I, didn't, I don't want to say, don't call me unless you have $100,000 to invest. I, I don't want to say that. Right. Well, I think you've answered my question or the question of other people. When are you coming back from Pender Harbor? Well, we're not. We're going to leave here and then head north. And we hope to be home by the middle of September. Must be nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I understand it's nice on Salt Spring these days, which is where the home is. Yeah, that you have visited. Yeah, so, I know. I've I've been there, so you can you can tell uh, my clients that you're already a client of mine. If you yeah. want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Fred. Uh, Peter, very 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 good comments, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate them. Well, you're very welcome, my friend. And we were listening to your show. Yeah, and you have a great weekend. Take care. Okay. Bye for Bye now. now. Okay, uh, Peter from Pender Harbor, he's gone, but that line is now open. So if you've just joined us, I remind you once again, ladies and gentlemen and listeners out there, that I'm certified financial planner Fred Snyder, also a registered financial planner representing Scotia McLeod. My mission, my raison d'etre, is to teach people what they need. And the key word there is teach. Teach people what they need to know 
to make better financial decisions so that they can keep more of their hard-earned dollars. And statistically, the stats tell us, you can go to StatsCan, you can look it up if you don't believe me. Statistically, we don't do a very good job in that area. Again, at the sound of, or at the risk of being repetitious, 100 people today who are 25 years of age, by the time they end up at 65, one is rich or wealthy. Four are well-to-do, five are still working, 36 are dead, there's 54 left, they're dead, broke, dependent on family and state. So I'm saying that 1% of the people by age 65, 1% are wealthy and four are well-to-do. That's 5% that achieve any measure of financial success. That's not very good, that's 5%. Five are still working. Some of those that are still working are okay financially, and some aren't. I don't know what the split is. Let's say it's two. So we got 7% of the population that by the time they're 65 achieve any measure of financial success. And if you look at these same people again, by the time they end up at 70, half of those have fallen back to be financially independent because they didn't deal with taxes and they didn't deal with inflation. I see too many people that come into my office that are receiving the old age pension plan because they're 65, that are getting it clawed back because they saved too much money. The money that's coming in from their RRSP that they don't need the income is causing their old age pension to be clawed back. So they get, they, they have an, a, enough of an income that they're paying a marginal tax rate of 43.7%, plus they're losing $6,000 a year because the old age pension plan is clawed back. Ouch, that's a lot of taxes. And there's a new marginal tax rate in British Columbia. It's over 50% if you right at the top of the line. Now that means that at the margin, on the last dollar you earned, half goes provincially and federally to the government. Half of it. So what are you doing about that? How are you mitigating your taxes? What is your financial plan all about? And that's what we'll talk about when we come back after the break. So don't go away. Snyder. I want people to call the show that are genuinely interested in increasing their financial IQ so that they can become financially independent sooner and stay financially independent longer. Fred Snyder. You don't have a blueprint. Imagine trying to build a house without a blueprint. And, and, and how about having a blueprint for your life? What are your lifestyle goals? You need to think about your family life. What are your goals about your family life? What are your lifestyle goals when it comes to health? What are your lifestyle goals when it comes to finances? mental and spiritual. You have to set goals in all those areas, not just finances. Fred Snyder. Often we fail because we put too much emphasis on one area and ignore everything else. We work our butts off and, and we ruin our health. So life is all about balance. So you need a you need a life plan. Fred Snyder. Napoleon Hill says this, wrote the book Think and Grow Rich. Anything that you can vividly imagine, ardently desire, and enthusiastically act upon will inevitably come to pass. Fred Snyder. My goal, my mission is to help people enhance their financial IQs by teaching, teaching them what they need to know to make better financial decisions. Fred Snyder, Sunday mornings at 9 on AM 650. This is CISL Vancouver. All time favorites, AM 650. Welcome back to It's Your Money on AM650. If you have a question for Fred, call 604-280-0650. Now, back to Fred. Okay, we're back. Remind you once again, we are live. We're taking your calls. We share this show with you, our listeners. And the second hour uh, of this uh, show, which uh, goes from 10 to 11, is live. And that's the same every Sunday. The first hour is a replay <clears throat> of uh, last week's show. So again, if you've just tuned in, I'm Certified Financial Planner Fred Snyder, also Registered Financial Planner, representing Scotia McLeod. My raison d'etre, my mission is to teach people what they need to know to make better financial decisions so that they can keep, keep more of their hard-earned money. The emphasis is on keep. We all earn a small fortune, but it's not about how much we make that counts. It's about how much we keep. 
And the best way to keep more money is to don't spend it all. You see, it's not your money once you've spent it. So your money is all about keeping money. So do you have a budget? Do you have a spending plan? Do you have an overall financial plan? Let's talk about that and much, much more. Uh, on the screen, if you're looking at the screen, I'm going to do an overview because uh, we're down to less than a half an hour here on the show, and I'd like to get through this. I want you to visualize a book. That book is your financial plan, and the book has some dividers in it. And the first divider says education, and the second divider says goals. The third divider says evaluate or evaluation. The fourth divider says cash management. The fifth divider says risk management. The sixth divider says debt management. The seventh divider says retirement planning. The eighth says capital creation. The ninth says estate planning or legacy. And uh, the tenth tab says overall review process. Those are the steps. Those are the segments of an overall financial plan. Education, goals, evaluation, cash management, risk management, debt management, retirement planning, capital creation, estate planning, and overall review. Now, people listening to this show, many of you out there are more interested. High net worth people are probably at or near retirement or in retirement. They're probably very tuned into estate planning. What's my will look like? What does that all, what's that all about? Some out there who are younger, just getting started out, are looking for more education. So how do you educate yourself financially? One way is just to listen to this show. How do you sit down and, goals. Goals is a topic unto itself. How do you establish mean, meaningful, worthwhile goals? You call a financial advisor, and the financial advisor says, what's your goal? Well, I want to be rich. When? Next year. Okay, how old are you? 25. So you're 25, you want to be rich when you're 26? Okay, how much money do you make? 30000 a year. Okay, what does rich mean? Well, I, I, I want to be a millionaire. You know, that is not a realistic objective. It's impossible. And that's the guy who spends all his money on the lottery and he gets real lucky and he wins it or if he's going to inherit some money or something like that. But generally speaking, that is not realistic. So you have to be able to set realistic goals. Evaluating where I stand right now. I want a list of your assets, your liabilities, your income, your expenses. We're talking about risk. I want to know about your insurance policies that are in place. Debt management. I want to know how much money you owe, whether the interest is deductible or not, whether it's high interest credit cards or what that's all about. Retirement planning. I want to know what your retirement budget looks like. I want to know what your budget looks like today. I want to know what your budget should be. Capital creation. Estate planning. I want to know about your will. When's the last time you updated your will? Do you have a representation agreement? Do you have an enduring power of attorney? All these are issues. Now, you got to review that. How do you review your plan? Do you have a financial advisor that can coach you and guide you and help you in the overall review of your whole plan? So I could spend a whole radio show or two or three just talking about these particular topics. I could take the next two hours and talk about capital creation. I don't have the time to do that. But I'm, I do want to emphasize one point. I call this the 10-step financial planning process. Starts with education, goals, evaluation, cash, risk, debt, retirement, capital, estate, overall review. Those are the steps. And those, have to, those steps have to be embedded in a financial plan. The financial plan has to have the best financial products inside it. There's got to be a review process. It's got to be in writing. That's the bridge. The financial plan is the bridge that takes you from where you are right now to where you want to go financially. If you don't have a plan, you're planning to fail. If you have a plan, you got a good chance of getting to where you want to go, providing you have enough time. So you want to become proactive about how you deal with your money, not reactive. The best way to become proactive is to say, I must get myself a written financial plan. I'm going to call Frida right now. So you can reach Frida right now at the office, area code 604-737-3512. If you're over on the island uh, or uh, outside of the local dialing range or long distance, it's 800-661-1495. Let's talk to Veronica 
from Vancouver. Veronica, welcome to the program. Thanks for calling. Veronica, are you there? Oh, yes, I am. Hi, Veronica. How are you? Pretty oh, good. How are you? Good. And thanks um, for calling. A, oh, no problem. I have a, a question regarding um, my father-in-law has just gone in a nursing home. Yes. And when he was widowed almost seven years ago, the house was put in my husband's name, his name, and his brother's name. Yes. Now, we're in the process of selling it. Um, do we? Do they have to pay capital gains? The house uh, was a principal residence at um, the time. My they, father-in-law. They, yeah, okay. How much has the house grown since they acquired it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you would be amazed. Is it, um, is it any chance that it's their principal residence? No. Well, then there's capital gains. On the total amount that we sell it for? No. No, only on the gain. From the oh, gain well. from the point of view that it... Let's say that the cost base of the house uh, when it was inherited was $100,000. i am just picking a sure. number out of the air. And let's say it's 200000 now. Okay. And they sell it for 200000 They have a capital gain of $100,000. Yeah. That's Fif- to be 50% split. of that 100000 is taxable, so they have to yeah. pay income tax at top marginal rates on, on 50000 That's right. going to be $25,000 almost. Now, um, my father-in-law is still living, so does that, like, does that matter? Does that matter that he's still alive and it's um, a gift? Doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah, matter. No, it's change, it's, you see, everybody, is, and this is what you have to understand, everybody, you, me, everybody else I know, we're entitled to have one principal residence. Yes. That grows tax-free, mm-hmm. but only one. Only so one. if I own two houses, I have to... I have to declare one of those two houses to be my principal residence. Oh, okay. And when, um, so when the house is sold, it goes in the name of the three individuals on the land title then? Or could it, does it just go in my father-in-law's name? Well, it, depends on, it depends on who it's sold to. Well, it would oh, be a I new see. owner when it's sold. Oh, okay. It, okay sounds, it's, it's, it sounds to me, Veronica, that you need advice. Yes. The best way to get that advice right now is to dial the phone, call Frida. Oh, okay. And Frida's down at the office, area code 604-737-3512. Okay, terrific. Uh, I'll repeat that again for our listeners. It's 604-737-3512. And should it be a long-distance call, it's 1-800-661-1495. Yeah, it's not long-distance. We're just in... I have to be careful that that, that people understand what I say, and I'm going to put a bit of a disclaimer out here right now. I'm going to say, if you hear something on this show, don't try to do it on your own, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Okay? You should always talk to your trusted financial advisor, whether that's me or somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yes, we love your program. We've called in many, many, many times. <laughs> well, I, re- I really appreciate that. And we're just at the house cleaning cleaning it out, like some of the kitchen and stuff. So okay. we've been listening to you, and I said to my husband, call in to Fred. He'll tell us what to do. Well, the bottom line is that you're dealing with a situation which sounds to be fairly complex. Yeah. And and that leaves a lot of room for misunderstanding. So I can can say something that you might misunderstand. There may be somebody else out there that hears that, and they might misunderstand it, and they may make some kind of a decision on that. Mm -hmm. And it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is that uh, if you hear something on this show, don't implement it without getting a second opinion or without talking to your financial advisor, whether it be me or somebody else. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for your advice, and we th- certainly enjoy your program. Veronica, thanks and for calling, we'll, and I can't we'll tell you how much I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Have enjoy the soccer game, eh? Pardon me? Enjoy the soccer game. Yeah. Oh, yes. Got to get home for that. <laughs> that should be a good one. Okay. okay thank you very much, Fred. Okay. If you just, thank, uh, thanks, Bye-bye. Veronica. So, again, Bye-bye. ladies and gentlemen and listeners out there, if you just tuned in, I'm certified financial planner, Fred Snyder, also registered financial planner, representing Scotia McLeod. And again, uh, my mission is to teach people what they need to know to make better financial decisions. Right now, we're talking about the question, what's the anatomy of a financial plan? Well, a financial plan is made up of plans within a plan. For example, an estate plan is part of an overall financial plan. A retirement plan is part of an overall financial plan. Uh, everybody should have a set of financial statements. That's step number three, set of financial statements, a listing of your assets, your liabilities, your income, your expenses. You should know what your net worth is. That's your benchmark. 
because your net worth, did it increase last year or decrease? If your net worth increased, that's good. If it decreased, that's not good. So if the market performance of your investments wasn't good, your your net worth might have decreased. Someone once said, how do you get out of the hole? The best way to get out of the hole is to stop digging. Okay? I, I, I mean, I want you to think about what that means. You're massively in debt. That's the hole. Okay? How do you stop digging? You stop spending uh, more than you earn. You just spend less than you earn. Sounds sounds easy. It's not so easy sometimes. Okay? But just you, you can't possibly spend more than you earn and sustain that. You're heading for the wall. You're going to get yourself so massively in debt, the interest expense on your debt just increases your expenses and it gets worse. If you look at your assets, your liabilities, your income, and your expenses, if your expenses exceed your income, then how do you cover the deficit? Where does that money come from? You either borrow it or you sell assets. If you borrow the money, you're decreasing your net worth. If you sell assets, you're decreasing your net worth. You have to make sure that your net worth is always increasing. The best way to do that is to make sure that your investments are tax efficient, uh, that you're not paying too much in income tax, that you have a budget that allows you to keep track of your money where you spend less than you earn on a regular basis. A good way to spend less than you earn is to make yourself your oldest obligation. Make yourself your oldest obligation and pay yourself first. Pretend that you're a debt and say from now on, every time I make uh, $1,000, I'm going to pay myself $100. Or every time I make $10,000, I'm going to pay myself $1,000. Or better still, I'm going to max out on my RRSP every year, and maybe my maximum RRSP contribution is 1000 a month. That's 12000 a year. That's going to save me about $4,000 a year in tax. I'm going to take that $4,000 in tax savings, and I'm going to put that into my TFSA. Okay, there's a plan. Or if you're already retired, I'm going to make sure that the income from my investments is going to be sufficient to pay my lifestyle expenses, and I'm going to help. I'm, I'm going to define my lifestyle expenses, and I'm going to use Stats Canada to find what they should be, and I'm going to sit down and write the numbers down as to what they are right now. So again, you know, you make three budgets. You say, this is my budget the way it is. This is my budget the way it should be. And this is my budget the way it will be when I retire. And then the next question is, uh, where does the money come from? Okay, so now you got to start looking at your sources of income. I'm I'm going to get Canada Pension Plan. I'm going to get old age pension. I'm going to get, uh, I have a private uh, defined benefit pension plan, which is going to pay me $2,000 a month. Uh, I'm going to, I got $500,000 sitting in investments. I'm going to put that into a GLWB, which is going to pay me, uh, uh, 400, 500 dollars a month, something like that, whatever the number is. Uh, again, so you define your income line by line by line. Every year, I'm going to get dividends. I'm going to invest in stocks or mutual funds that pay high dividends. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, GICs, uh, rental income, any form of income that you have. Maybe you rent a basement suite out. Maybe you take in home home homestay students. That kind of stuff. Uh, you, you go back to the expense side, and, and lots of people pay their property taxes. I generally don't think that people should pay their property taxes if they're at or near retirement, okay? Uh, if you're paying three or $400 a month in property taxes, you can legally defer those property taxes and increase your lifestyle today and have more money to save and invest and more money to be able to pay for that annual vacation that you should be taking and probably aren't because the money's too tight. So you need a financial plan. That's the bottom line. So a plan, then you have ongoing planning. That means you have a financial coach. And last but not least, you have a plan for selecting the best investments that go into the plan. And when I tell you once again, there's over 20,000 investment funds to pick from, it isn't an easy job to do that. Some of those investments have long-term track records. Some don't. Some are too risky. Some aren't risky enough. Uh, You have to be able to strike that balance. When you pick investments, you have to have investments which have negative correlations. You have to have, um, let's say you have 10 funds in your portfolio, five of those funds that should be positively negative, uh, 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 should have positive correlations, and the other five should be negatively correlated to the five that are positively correlated. 
Now, I said that at the risk of complicating stuff way too much. Don't like the word cor correlation. So just imagine a teeter-totter. One investment's on one side, the other investment's on the other side. One's going down, the other's going up. Now, this isn't always the case, but it's generally true that if U.S. stocks are going up, gold is going down. So if you're going to have gold in your portfolio, or if you want to mitigate or reduce the risk in investing in U.S. stocks, you should have some gold to counterbalance that, generally speaking. Now, I'm not saying that's true in all cases, so don't run out and start doing that based on what I just said. Talk to your financial advisor, be it me or somebody else, before you do that and say, how does this fit into the overall picture? You've heard me say this many, many, many times on this show. Don't try to do it on your own. Once again, talk to your trusted financial advisor before you implement anything. Get a second opinion. Look at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is your financial plan. Now, again, very, very, very rarely do I talk to somebody that comes into my office that has a written financial plan. Occasionally, yes, but very, very rarely. I want you to think about this. You want to be financially independent, and you don't have a plan. Would you try to build a house without a plan, a blueprint? You go to the bank and say, I want to borrow $500,000 because I want to open up my own business. What's the bank manager going to say? He says, show me your plan. I don't have one. You think you get the loan? Not in your life, okay? So it doesn't matter what it is. If it's meaningful, if it's worthwhile, you need a plan. And I've just outlined, once again, what that plan looks like. Do you have a... Uh, do you have a system where you've decided on how you're going to educate yourself financially? Because you're going to need to do that. You're going to need to do that. Now, you don't have a computer? I suggest the best way to educate yourself is to get a computer. I talked to Randy Reynolds one time, who's uh, very high up in the industry, and I asked him on a TV show that I did once, I said, what's the best way to educate yourself? He said, the Internet. There's no question about it. You can go on the Internet. You, you can look up almost anything on the Internet today. Become an expert Google user. You got a question going on the Internet, type in the question in Google. You'll get the answer. In fact, you'll get dozens of answers. Cut and paste those answers into a Word document and make yourself a research project on, on how to educate myself financially. Now you've made yourself your own little financial plan. Go into Google and look up goals, setting meaningful, worthwhile financial goals. Type that in and see what you get back. Turn that into a plan. How to evaluate my finances. Type that into Google. See what you get back. Cash management. See what you get back. Risk, you know, I could go on and on and on. But take those individual topics and Google them. Take the information that you get back, cut and paste it into a Word document, and write yourself a little book on each one of those. Make yourself a mini plan. Hey, and then take that, print it out, three-hole punch it, and put it into your binder under the appropriate section, whatever it might be. So once again, when we look at, at the bottom line and, and, and we talk about your estate plan, I'm going right up to step number nine for those who have a high net worth, and I want to talk about this particular issue you have an estate plan. Then I've had calls along these lines today. You are faced with a deemed disposition at the moment you die. When you die, you're deemed to have sold everything you own at fair market value. That means that if you have a profit, if you have capital gains inside that portfolio that don't attribute to your principal residence, anything other than that, your business, your stocks, your mutual funds, you've now sold them for their uh, market value, deduct from that the adjusted cost base, and the difference is a taxable capital gain. And that tax has to be paid. Where does the money come from? Where are you going to get the money to be able to extinguish the capital gain created by a deemed disposition? Insurance is certainly one way to do that, okay? So, um, and I could do a whole radio show on that particular topic, but you can rest easy. I'm not going to. Let's talk to Jill from Vancouver. Jill, welcome to the program. Hi, Jill. Hello. 
Hi, Jill. You're on the line, or, yes. you're, or you're on the air. Yes, a very quick question. Sure. Uh, you're, I enjoy your show very much. Thank you. Uh, my question is, if you were to suddenly have uh, something land in your hands, like a share in a... Um, um, a Say, uh, like a city savings, um, not a bank, but, um, you know, like, say, Van City or some city savings gr- uh, group, mm-hmm. where would you go to find out what the value of something like that would be worth? Well, I don't, I'm not sure where I'd start, but it, I guess it depends on what it is. If it's a stock, you can easily find that out. Um, but I just, um, I just talked about Google. Uh, Google. Mm-hmm. Generally, when I want to find almost anything these days, I just go to Google. I type it in, and I'm amazed what you can find out. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you want to tell me what it is or not. It's up to you. It's at the Fisherman's Credit Union. The Fisherman's Credit Union. Okay, well, that's a good Google question right there. You you type that into Google, you'll find out exactly what that is. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, and, and uh, t- tell me something. Are you computer literate? No, not at all. Not at all? That's why I was afraid to ask you. Is, is, is there anybody in your house that is? I can certainly find one, yes. D- do you have a computer? No. You have an iPad? No. You have an iPhone? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. I have well, a rotary dial telephone, and that's it. Well, my. So okay. I'm sure you're going to think I'm very ancient, but no, I'm not. No, really not, 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 not at all. i got to tell you a story. Okay, mm-hmm. my wife has an aunt. God knows she might be listening to this show right now. She's ninety-two. Mm-hmm. She'd never touched a computer in her life. My grandson went over, got her a computer, set it up, showed her how to use it. She's having a ball. <laughs> Good for her. She never touched a computer in her life. Mm-hmm. I almost think I should uh, start a business on teaching people that are in retirement how to use. There's too many people in retirement that come into my workshops that are totally computer literate. They're afraid of them. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be afraid of. If you just learn how to do one thing, you get yourself an iPad or an iPhone, you learn how to load Google, and there's a square box. You type in the question that you want the answer to. That's all you really need to know, and you can find out almost anything that you want to know. Sounds good. Okay, I'll see what I can uh, research. Thank Jill, you. Jill, I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care. Okay, we're just about uh, out of time here right now, so I want to give the numbers out once again. So if you've been listening to the show, if you want a financial plan, if you want a second opinion on your investment portfolio, if you want to become more proactive instead of reactive with how you deal with your money, if you want to take that first step, Somebody once said, you know, you walk a mile and then you can see further. Okay. Well, it's true. It really is. If you want to take that step, this is what you do. You call Frida at area code 604-737-3512. If you're calling long distance, it's 800-661-1495. And she'll be down there for the better part of the day. So uh, if you want to give her a call, Make an appointment to see myself for a second opinion on your investment portfolio. Get yourself a written financial plan. Anything else that you want, give Frida a call. I'm going to close off just by going back to some of these issues. Uh, these are issues which are on my web page. And my web page, uh, 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 once again, these, these are executor duties. So if, if, if you go to my webpage, which is F. Snyder uh, Group, yes, where's the URL here? Hold on. Anyway, executor duties. And if you call Frida, we can make sure that you get a copy of this. And there's all kinds of issues on my webpage that you, you should take a look at. I'm out of time, so I have to go. Uh, we'll see you same time, same station next week. Bye for now. If you'd like Fred to review your portfolio, call his office right now at 604-737-3512. That's 604-737-3512.